Hello, uh, my name is Stuart Leakes and I'd like to welcome you to this talk on Opera North's new production of The Seven Deadly Sins with words by Bertolt Brecht and music by Kurt Weill. Uh, this is a very exciting event for us at Opera North um, because it's the first time that the company has staged a fully staged production since the outbreak of COVID-19 back in March. Um, and it's probably even more exciting for our guests at this talk, uh, who are the conductor and leading authority on the music of Kurt Weill, Jim Holmes, uh, Gary Clark, who is the director and choreographer of this new production, and the singer Wallace Junter and the dancer Shelley Eva Hayden, who both take the leading role of Anna in the show, which is a subject which I'm sure we will return to as the conversation goes on. Um, now, Brecht and Weil had begun working together in Berlin in the 1920s, and they had a huge success with the Threat and the Opera in 1928. But by the time they were working together on the rise and fall of the city of Mahogany in uh, 1930, their working relationship had hit a decidedly rocky patch. So Jim, um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the circumstances in which Brecht and Weil came together again in 1933 in Paris uh, to work on The Seven Deadly Sins. Well, it's worth saying in the first place that Brecht and Weil as, in, as a partnership were never George and Ira Gershwin. They had uh, come together in rather, even now, rather dubious circumstances. One doesn't know the exact details. They were very, very uh, different in the terms of their background. They did have common aims, obviously, in what they wanted music theatre and lyric theatre to do. Uh, and but they were always kind of formal. They it's notable that they used the the German Z, the formal Z form when they spoke to each other, rather than uh, rather than the more intimate do. And uh, it, it's the as you've said the, the the fallout really came in the production of Mahagoni, which had been an ongoing project for them since 1927 when they first met. And the problem really uh, arose from the uh, conflict between music and drama. Uh, their greatest success was obviously based on, on uh, the Thrupney Opera was, was based on a piece where in a way the words and the music had kind of equal prominence. Uh, in other words, the song, the sung play. As an opera, um, the, the music naturally becomes more to the forefront and, and Brecht, really couldn't get on with this, particularly as during the years of their collaboration, he'd more and more drifted, if you like, towards the, uh, the, the Marxist end of thought, a, a, a direction which Weil didn't feel he could follow. So the result of that was that um, Mahagoni was a, a rather fraught affair when they, they, they mounted the full scale opera in 1931. Um, however, it is also notable that, that they actually managed, maybe because of the formality of their relationship, not to, to, to split with total rancour. They kept the, the, the channels of communication open and they were still interested in, in working together. Of course, for both of them, at the beginning of 1933, the, uh, the Nazis came to power and they were both, for their differing reasons, compelled to flee from Berlin. Brecht became a kind of Anna figure because he'd started to tour Europe and, and ended up in a number of cities around the continent. Weil, on the other hand, went to Paris where in the previous year he'd enjoyed a success. In fact, um, he and Brecht had both enjoyed success there. But Weil went straight to Paris with his uh, wife, Lotte Lenya. And while he was there, he was approached by an Englishman called Edward James, who was a philanthropist and who was involved with the creation of a company called uh, Le Ballet 1933. And um, James wanted a, a, a piece for his uh, 
wife, or rather at this stage his estranged wife, a dancer called Tilly Losh. James was also a great admirer of Lottie Lenya. And so gradually the idea evolved that they would create a work involving the two of them, as it were, a sung ballet, which initially was called Anna Anna. Now, Vile's first choice for the sung text was Jean Cocteau, but Cocteau wasn't really interested. And it was at this stage that Brecht came into the picture. Weil asked him and he agreed to do it. Now it should be said that, that Brecht's contribution was uh, to a degree that we're not entirely sure about, finite. He wrote a libretto and at some relatively early stage in the proceedings, he opted out of it. He, he, we know that because we know that some of the uh, alterations that were made during the process to the spoken text, which Brecht would all normally have done, were done by Weil himself, and probably in collaboration with his creative partners like Caspar Nea, the designer. So uh, there's no doubt that, that, that Sins, in a way, emphasises, uh, if you like, the, the fact that they could still collaborate, and it is in, indeed, in the terms of Weil, it's one of the most significant and important and indeed wonderful works of his European period. But at the same time, it manages to emphasize the, the rift that had, had emerged between them and the difference in ideology that had eventually driven them apart. That's a really fascinating context. And, and, uh, and it's pretty clear from what you're saying, Jim, that that in a sense, there is a, the, the biographical background to, to the creation of the show um, is even more important perhaps in this case than it might usually be. And also that wider, you know, kind of historical political context in, in terms of, of both of these men, uh, in a sense, being exiled from, from their home country. So Gary, um, I, I wondered if I could ask you to what extent that biographical historical um, context that Jim's been, been setting out for us uh, has, has influenced the way that you've approached the production? Um, I would say in, a, in quite a big way. Um, when I got asked to do the opera, the first thing I did was speak at length with Jim about the history of Weil and Brecht and the opera. Um, and once I, we started to uncover the history of uh, these people suddenly it became very clear that the seven deadly sins was autobiographical <laughs> and i really wanted to highlight that somehow um and what interested me was that we are introduced to this family in the first scene but we never really know their background and i really wanted to give the family a background and you know something that struck me was this idea of them wanting to build a house in Louisiana and I said well where do they live now where are they from <laughs> and why do they need to build a house and me and Jim talked at length about this and I thought it's really important that I give this family some historical reference about why they're in America and why they're so desperately trying to earn money and I went back to this idea of violent Brecht um, in exile and leaving Germany quite swiftly because of the rise of the Nazis um, and the kind of fear that that's attached with and almost linking it now to politics and immigration and how people are fleeing with nothing and becoming harmless. Um, so that felt really clear for me. And, um, and I really wanted to try and um, even in small ways, just, just highlight the history of this family and give them a place that didn't make them Americans, but, but that gave a sense of coming from another place with nothing. Um, and the idea of the two Annas and linking that to both, um, you know, the partners of Lotta and, um, who's the other one? Lotta Lenya and... Edward James. No, the other, oh God, Jim's just... Tilly Lodge. Tilly Lodge, Tilly Lodge, I get them mixed up. Um, the fact that these were two women um, who was a singer and a dancer, I wanted to, and then they, it, they became these characters within the opera of a singer and a dancer. It all felt very, very close for me. So I wanted to highlight all of that. And then with that, I also wanted to look at the kind of style of Brecht and his work. He already had a theatrical style, which I wanted to really bring out in the work. And a lot of that was political and deal, dealt with uh, class and place 
and identity, which linked again with the biograph biographical um, kind of characteristics of the writing um, of the opera. So yeah, it played a huge part and we talked about it in great detail. Um, and it, even coming through the design and just the colors and the text and um, yeah, the kind of positioning of the family on stage and the relationship between the Annas and the family and having the family not just there as a as narrators of, of action, but very, very embedded within the work as, as, a, as a character as a whole and that they play a function in the piece as well. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, just just to quickly outline then um, the 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 plot in in a sense of the piece. Um, we have uh, Anna one who sings and Anna two who dances, and they travel to seven American cities uh, in order to make enough money, as as Gary was saying, uh, for their family, their mother, father, and two brothers. To build a house uh, in in Louisiana. Um, so, Wally uh, and Shelley, I wonder if I could turn to you. Um, I think that that Anna one and Anna two have been played at different times as uh, two sides of the same personality, or possibly as as identical twin sisters. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us about what you have discovered and established about their character or characters um, as rehearsals have, have gone along. Sure, happy to. I've done this piece before in different ways. I've even done it as a one woman show where I am the whole Anna <laughs> without dancing. <laughs> but um, in our production, I think we're doing a bit of a hybrid. So we are looking at it both practically and symbolically. Uh, practically in the show and in the English translation that we're using, we the very first line is, my twin sister and I come from Louisiana, my twin sister. So we are thinking of it practically as identical twins, but I'm outwardly so. We play that, you know, we're not actually trying to uh, present as if we were one person. Um, and we couldn't anyway with the social distancing because we can never get near each other. But um, symbolically, I think we really are interpreting it like we are two halves of the same person. I represent the analytical side, the brains, um, the part of you that is critical of yourself, the conscience. And uh, Anna too represents the heart, the soul, the vulnerability, the, the loving part. Um, so obviously I play a role in oppressing that side of of her or of myself throughout the piece in order to achieve the goals that have been set out for us, which brings me to the relationship with the family. To me, they represent much less than actual parents and siblings. They represent um, the expectations of capital society on a person in that structure, in that framework. They are the oppressors. They are the ones that set the parameters for what you need to do to sacrifice to fit in to achieve success within this system and we obey them or i obey them and i force her to do so with me um so we don't really have in our production anyway we don't really have a relationship with them as family members they operate more like a, a great chorus theatrically and this looming presence that informs our choices and leads us down this path of uh, sacrifice I'm still muted and now I'm not. <laughs> uh, for me, it, Anna one and Anna two, are they one person? Are they two people? For me, that's just still a question. And that, that's what I think Anna two would do. Uh, she's so inquisitive and playful and there's so much detail in life. And when she arrives in this deprived Hollywood. She's still looking at the details in the space and around her and she's living this dream, I guess, which is why Anna Wan's always pulling her down to, to earth. And I think Shelley's got that little bit of an approach to the, to the production because I'm a little bit like that. And I can't ever answer that question if we're the same person or if we're 
twins because I like that question and sometimes I'll do the whole show thinking that actually we were twins then I'm nothing alike I'm nothing alike the other one and sometimes I'll think oh we're the same person oh dear <laughs> and I love the conflict and I love that it always changes and I love that it's never answered for me so it feels like a discovery each time like almost I like the idea of the psychology behind that with with ourselves because often we we go that was very unlike me but it still came from you so I like that psychology and that battle between the Annas and whether we're the same person or we're not so that's that it's still alive for me and I think I'll never find the answer and I really enjoy that it's it's an absolutely fascinating idea isn't it that you know we, we have these the, these two and we, we're using both song and dance to 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 represent them um, in combination we touched on the on the social or the physical distancing um which has to be in place of the show which we'll, we'll, we'll come back to i'm sure um but I'm really interested just to talk a little bit more about that relationship and about the fact that Anna Wan, of course, can express herself through words because she sings, she has the, she has the sung text. You get one or two very uh, brief interjections from, from Anna too. But mostly Anna too is having to express herself through, through dance, through movement. Oh. So um, Gary and Shelley, uh, I wonder if you could you could talk a little bit about how you've arrived at the kind of choreographic movement elements of the show because I'm guessing in a sense because you haven't got a fixed text that there's a bit more interpretive freedom in terms with uh, of what you can do there and the way that you can you can respond to the music so could you tell us a little bit about how you've you've developed and worked on that yeah well I think when you look at the production and you look at the seven sins um it's full of movement and it's full of action. Each scenario that the Annas find themselves in has a nod to a physical presence. An example of that would be the cabaret club when they discover pride. I mean, cabaret in the 1930s had a whole catalog of physical activity. Um, so did um, Hollywood movie sets, which they find themselves in during anger. And, and so on throughout the production. The fact that Anna gets a job as a dancer when she discovers gluttony. So it, w when I read it, I wasn't um, struggling to find where to locate the movement. It seemed very clear for me where um, movement would come from. What was important for me is that we just, we didn't enter just with the production and the knowledge of the production, but that we looked much further historically and politically and socially about what was happening with dance, with movement, with film, with cabaret around 1930s, not only in America, but also in Germany. And I set off on a research project for myself, which was really exciting, where I started to highlight certain figures or productions or um, iconic historical points which changed art, film and movement and start to pepper the work with these, these references. So it wasn't just device from me or the performers, but it had a much deeper political resonance. So we've looked at, at many different figures around the thirties, looking at, you know, Busby Berkeley and his approach to film and Hollywood against people like Valeska Gert, who was this kind of feminist punk in Germany, um, who was damned, you know, and, and who was, shouted down because women wasn't supposed to behave in that way um right through to like charlie chaplin and then looking at the dying swan with anna pavlova and the relationship there between dance and, and weight and food so and that was a really fun process to go through so the whole show is kind of peppered with physical references and then it was about trying to allow shelly the space to embody these uh, moments and to interpret these moments so sometimes we would do something called sampling where we would copy exactly what is what these people did and then allow it to sit in the body and see where it would take us um, sometimes it was about watching things and then bringing in a whole new interpretation to that so we had lots of different approaches um, to the process and I guess what was hard this whole relationship with song and 
uh, movement is that Wally is a fantastic mover. <laughs> and we, in, in, in the beginning stages, we were really excited about that. And we were like, yeah, and Wally can dance and she can do this and she can do that. And we started to get really involved. And then suddenly it was like, oh, actually both Annas are now movers. So there was an imbalance there. So unfortunately, we had to say to Wally, you're going to have to move less. You are the voice, Shelley's the body, which was really frustrating, but we knew it was the right thing to do. Just so we're really clear on who's the singer and who's the dancer, because those are the two characters. Um, but, you know, maybe one day we do another production, Wally, and we can, <laughs> we can make you move more. Maybe if I'm not six months pregnant, it might work. <laughs> But that was a really good learning curve, actually. It really gave me clarity on that. So I thought, actually, we've really got to make the difference between the two Annas really clear for me. So Wally does have a physical pre presence, like Shelley has got, you know, some vocal work. But, um, yeah, the balance now is, is, much, is much clearer. So, yeah, the, the, uh, the finding of the physical language has been a, a great joy and something that we've been really proactive with and, uh, and I think is really strong in the show. And for me, very similar, like I can, it was, it was great to work with Gary in a way that, cause he has a whole opera to direct really. So there was quite a lot of trust in me and he would give me so much research and a lot of the sins. So one to seven would always have a reference or a time or an inspiration or a person or a feeling or a movement. So for me, stepping into each box is like stepping into a world. And that was so exciting choreographically to discover that. And sometimes I'd be with Gary, sometimes Gary would just like put me in a corner and go, yes, no. <laughs> and that was brilliant. It was, it was really exciting because then I get to find that world. It, it was, it's really great. And even the lighting on the show adds to that because you just step into some sort of you're in the darkness and then you you're spat into something and as a performer that's just so so thrilling to be able to hop from these extremes so yeah choreographically uh, we also have like sometimes we have props a bench a, a cabaret stage some ostrich feathers i mean this has been so fun and also tricky as well like it's not it's not been easy. We've got restraints. For example, each sin is danced in a box and you can't pass the lines. I remember Wally saying, wouldn't it be great if we could just, you know, lift the lines for a minute or something? And it's tricky. And then we all had this moment where we stopped and talked for about an hour about what, you know, we could ignore the lines, but we're not going to. And oh, we also have to social distance. So there was there was so many restrictions and limits on top of COVID-19 and having to distance, on top of the, his, the history of the piece, on top of the props. So there's a lot. And on top of the putting the family onto that choreography when I'm trying to spin around the space and Wally's a part of me and my twin, but yet we're not next to each other. It's, it's, it's been really complex, but so full on and vibrant and just yeah for movement wise it's really exciting for me and I think for everyone I think even the, the family are moving you know it's choreographically it's a really it's a it's a it's a moving opera absolutely so and that's yeah that's really exciting great thank you um, yeah, I think I think one of the fabulous things about this piece is that it's only 35 minutes long, but there is so much, so much packed into it um, in, in all sorts of ways. Um, and, and Shelley and, and both Gary, they were you've been talking a bit, a bit about the, the, you know, the actual staging of it. Um, it's been brilliantly designed by George Johnson Lee, uh, working, I know, like you all have been, absolutely breakneck uh, breakneck speed to make this this piece of work um, and it's been lit by by Mike Locke uh, because and, and as Shelley said that the lighting is a hugely important part of, of, of the experience uh, and you were talking about boxes there um, I, I noticed I wonder if you can just um, Gary talk us through a little bit about the the kind of principles that underpin the design and, and how you're using the, the, the design and the, the stage that the quarry theatre at the play has to tell the story uh, of, of the piece. 
well, once I knew it was going to be at the quarry at the playhouse, I because I know the space, I know that as an audience, when you first walk in, the first thing you see is the floor. And I thought it was too much of a good opportunity to ignore that. So I wanted um, the floor to have quite a striking design, um, first and foremost. So we're looking down on it. I think it's fair to say if this production was at the Grand Theatre, I probably would have done it very differently. So the floor and the fact that the audience kind of looked down onto the piece really gave the first starting points of these boxes. Um, so I wanted a kind of graphic design in space. I also knew that we had to cover seven cities with seven sins over seven years in seven different locations. So I thought, how can we split up the stage to um, signify these seven areas? We weren't allowed to have any set, anything moving because of COVID. So we had to really think creatively about how to separate the stage into these areas, these cities. Um, and I was really inspired by the film Dogville, um, which is a film set in the Depression in the 30s by Lars von Trier. And um, it's, it's, it's almost in a theatre space and the, there's a whole town and it's marked out with these kind of white lines. And I really liked that construct. And I did a bit of reading and I looked at this was also very Brechtian. Um, so I started to look a lot at, at, at the way uh, Brecht Theatre and Epic Theatre was staged and all of the constructs surrounding that. And it just provided with me and George um, everything that we needed. So we used that as a kind of basis to stage the works because the works, when I say works, the sins um, happen in each city or area it has a location and we really wanted to give each location a um an anchor a physical anchor in space an installation for a better word um and each sin provided us with that anchor so for instance sin one we're in a park there's a park bench sin two we're in a cabaret club there's a cabaret table and a cabaret stage sin three we're in a hollywood film studio there's a film camera and so on and so forth. So we almost became very explicit with our locations. The beauty of this is that all of these um, installations exist on stage simultaneously. So what we're not doing is bringing things on and off. So it becomes a kind of landscape. It becomes a small town and village that the performers move in and around. And we're able to highlight this with our lighting and direct an audience to where the main focus needs to be. So we work with this idea of two worlds. We've got our sin boxes, and then the space in between is what we call no man's land. And this is where the family live. And in terms of texture and color and space, they're, they're very, very different. The sin boxes are very, very stark, epic, white, Brechtian lighting. The space in between the no man's land is more ambiguous. It's murky, it's muddy, it's more sludgy. We looked at a lot of references of uh, the shanty towns and Hoovervilles that were springing up in America during the Depression, and that really helped to give that uh, the the colour and the texture of the not only of the lighting but of the the overall aesthetic of the piece. Um, and George was really keen that we should umbrella this with a huge decaying uh, Hollywood sign above uh, the orchestra. So in a way, the, the, the set and the stage also acts as a kind of desolate, derelict Hollywood film set that's been abandoned and that these two Annas uh, are almost kind of reenacting these sins like they're part of some sort of weird production or weird film and that the orchestra and Jim are also very much part of that picture. We've positioned them at the very back of the stage. So they're very present. We don't just see that. We don't just hear them, but we actually see them. They're, they're a character within the work and that was really clear for me that they they had to be part of the overall aesthetic so it's a very busy um stage but everything has got its place everything is strategically placed um as a choreographer i i don't just see choreography within movement and action i see it within the composition of the space and how that interacts with the performers and um the impact that just moving something from one place to another has um on the overall vision of the piece and that on top of social distancing <laughs> i think gives the work quite a rich aesthetic which maybe we would never have had um 
in a normal circumstance. Yeah, that's uh, you, you mentioned um, social distancing, or, or perhaps more more accurately, physical distancing, which of course has had to you know the two meters has had to be observed uh, both in rehearsals and in the in, in the staging. Um, so actually, maybe turning to 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 you, Wally and and Shelley, and, and maybe then Jim too. I wonder if you could tell talk us about what have been the kind of main challenges of working within within those constraints, but also whether you know in some ways um, whether it's presented any sort of creative opportunity uh, as well. Yeah, sure. Um, I actually. I might be the only one that feels this way, but part of my training um, as a stage performer was this system of movement called viewpoints um, with a, a choreographer, a dancer, an actor in, uh, in Canada called Michael Grey Eyes. And I've always really held on to that training um, because it's very important to me when I'm on a stage to be energetically and physically aware of all the other moving parts, all the other performers and um, even you know inanimate objects of my relationship to them and the energy exchange and it's a bit of a kind of new age hippie way of thinking about it but I really really feel that I feel the pull of people and I feel the push of people and I often find with colleagues that they are not on that level and they just kind of break into my energetic area and it's it's weird for me you know but this is the first show where I've actually felt like everybody's on the same wavelength. We are all super hyper aware of our relationship to each other on the stage and the tension between each of us and the kind of push and pull and the I can't move until you move thing is really, really fun for me. I'm actually loving it and I'm finding it quite liberating um, artistically because this is something that I've always yearned for and usually don't find. Um, and in terms of the challenge of it, Again, to be honest, it, maybe I'm the only one, it's weird, but because social distancing is so normal now in day-to-day -day life, I actually feel kind of uncomfortable if people come close to me. So, you know, it's working for now. If we were to stage it like this in a couple of years and we're hopefully all back to normal, I'd probably feel a lot more trapped by it. But in the moment, um, as much as I'd love to be near Shelley and be able to go where I want to go, um, this framework is working for me. I'm not sure how close you'd want to be to me. I'm very sweaty in this show. <laughs> I think it's a good thing. Uh, restrictions wise, uh, for me, it's more timing. So I'm thinking about, in fact, because it's been plugged into the show from the, from the offset, actually, you not, you haven't had to think about it too much because it was created with that distance. I guess the, what, there's like two moments in the show where I go, wait for the person to pass, boom, you know? So for me, it's timing actually, but because it's done so well and it was really thought about from the offset, I only have to think about that really, uh, timing-wise to do with timing twice. And the rest of the show is really thought about. So I haven't got to uh, consider that because I know we're always going to be at that distance. And um, there's a nice moment, I'll come to it later, it's one of my favorite moments in the show. Um, and it was made because it wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for the distance and it was only created because of the distance. So I'll, I'll save that for later. <laughs> That's me. Um, obviously from a musical point of view, the, the, the main challenge is to do with ensemble and contact between players together, working together. In terms of the orchestra, one doesn't worry so much because we are blessed with one of the great listening orchestras and the, one of the great contact orchestras of the world and who uh, almost had developed amongst themselves a sense of ESP. I feel very comfortable with that. In, as far as the production itself goes, um, the, the, the principal um, concern was, has obviously been with the family, which, uh, the, which of course in this piece is played by four men, mother being the bass and uh, the way that we still manage to keep the sense of close harmony which is very very important in in this in this piece as it was through, through a lot of Viles work the the four voice male quartet was something he was very very fond of um 
so that's a problem. I think it's I think it's an adv it's also an interesting uh, opportunity in the sense that it enables you enables you to highlight certain certain um, voices within the ensemble um, rather more than you might in other in other uh, scenarios. And <coughs> excuse me. And from uh, what I what I what I should say is that the, the thanks to Gary's endless patience and cooperation, we've been able to work and just look at the, the people within the context and say, right, can I please swap X with Y? And then let's hear how that sounds. And um, that's that's been very, very valuable to have that sense of, of freedom. We've been able to move people like that, even within these terribly confining uh, circumstances that we are all in. Um, so, it's it's been both kind of if you like in you know restricting but also kind of quite liberating and it's also made us well certainly made me think an, anew about the whole um if you like the whole um vertical aspect of this music if you like uh, when, when people work work together um a, along with the with the linear i i found it very very invigorating very enriching and um as i said thanks to gary's cooperation um it's it seems to be working all right so uh we go for it brilliant um i'd just like to finish up um if i may by asking you each to choose a, a single favorite moment from the show that, that, that anybody who's is going to be seeing it uh, should look or listen out for or both um Oh God, that's so tricky because the piece is so complex and it moves so quick. I don't think any number is longer than five minutes. You know, it's it, it's really it's it's quite a quick show. Um, something a moment that I really enjoy and that I've really enjoyed seeing is there's a moment where um, we get an a cappella number with the family. And I've matched that up with a version of the Dying Swan. And I had a vision of this and that it's about two rhythms existing in the space at the same time. And I never knew if it was going to work or not. And I remember being in the studio and just saying, let's just give it a go. And suddenly it came to life and the vision was there. Um, so for me, that's a real, that was a, a great achievement and something that I really um, hold on to and something that I really, um, I really like as part of the show. But I also have another one. Can I have two? <laughs> I'm going to have two. I'm just going to take two. I love the moment where um, Anna Wan softens during Sin 5 um, and we start to feel her fragility. And I can't watch it without having a tear to my eye. And just to see both Annas existing in the same place for just a moment, we just get this glimmer of... Anna as one and I really I really I think that's a really beautiful beautiful moment in the show so I have two yeah I actually was uh I was gonna say that one too so I suppose I will echo Gary's second moment because for me that's also really the only time where I let my humanity shine through um as the brutal side of the personality and it's a sin number five is lust and we, we really do see um, both of us, Shelley and I, falling in love with the same man. For her, it's a wonderful thing that she abandons herself to. And for me, it's something that I punished myself for. Which leads me to my actual favorite moment that I guess I will use, which is the subsequent poison-tongued lecture that I give to her, to myself, and to the world at large on the necessary sacrifices and the material rewards to be reaped from um, fully subscribing to this cold-hearted capitalism that you can tell Brecht was quite um, excited to condemn um, through the hypocrisy in this piece. Uh, it's, it's a really exciting moment at the end where I just almost like I rip everything up and just say this is what you have to do if you want to make it in the world. And it's bloody and brutal. And isn't it great? Because look at all the money. And I don't feel that way, but I love diving into that moment. <laughs> ah, it's going to have to be two. And it's the, sa it's the same as everyone else. It's, um, it's lust. It's number five where 
uh, we all crack a little bit, you know, both of the Annas crack and it's, it's my rest actually. So I've danced a lot and then I suddenly get a rest and then I get to feel because it's been quite, you know, go, go, go. And then I, I stop and then it, all of the, the, what the feelings come over me because I get to be quiet and it's very much Anna, Anna Wan's moment, but I am feeling so much in that moment. So that's that's my favorite. And the second one, I just have to have them too, is what I mentioned earlier about the moment that was created because of social distancing. Because ideally in a real world, there's a moment where we just hold hands for a second, the sisters. And you see it, it's quick. You really have to watch out for it. But one of us reaches, the other reaches. We look, we would hold. And you just get that distance of a handhold. And it's just gorgeous. It's very quick, but that little moment is is a gem because of the physical distancing that we've had to do. So they're, they're my two. <laughs> You're muted, Jim. Right, done it. Okay, sorry. Um, one of the things about the design, which uh, uh, oh, oh, is brilliant, as Gary says, is it also actually reflects the music, which I think, uh, which is, of course, a, a, a mixture of this extraordinary diversity created by seven different locations and over seven years, but also this sense of unity. And, and, and I think that's, that's at the heart of what Vile was trying to do because he's, he, the piece is one of the most astonishingly unified and symmetrical pieces you will ever come across. It, it, it goes in a single arch with the, with the family's uh, quartet that Gary referred to, solo quartet with the dying swan at the center of it. And um, I, I, love, I love the whole arch, but actually for me, one of the great moments of the piece is the actual very end of it where the music from the beginning is reworked in a much more concise way with a with a much heavier tread with the sense of exhaustion at the end of a of a journey and at the very very final moment of the piece uh, there is a chord of C major, which in most general musical parlance, you would say is associated with joy and light and uh, happiness, but which somehow ends up sounding like the saddest chord in the world. And I think that's a, a remarkable achievement from a remarkable composer at the end of a remarkable piece. Well, thank you all very much for, for your insights. Um, and I'm sure it's, it's whetted everybody's appetite for the show. It certainly has mine. So thank you very much. And thank you all for, for watching and listening. Thank you. Goodbye.